technology here. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be here today to talk to you about some of the key advances in the economics of labor markets uh, in respects in which this is related to antitrust enforcement. So um, I'm really happy that uh, the prior remarks introduced the topic uh, already. So indeed, recently, we've seen a growth uh, of labor antitrust enforcement. And in a way, you could say that this is an infinite growth because we're starting from almost zero. Uh, so while labor antitrust enforcement exists, it is as been said before, muted compared to product market antitrust enforcement. And this, this creates a litigation gap that we discussed in my paper with uh, Eric Posner. And so, um, you know, looking at this, you might think that this implies that obviously labor markets are competitive. Obviously, there is no issue with competition in the labor market. So today, I want to convince you that, in fact, labor markets are not perfectly competitive, and it is worthwhile to look at the ways in which anti-competitive practices affect workers in the labor market. So uh, why should we care about this? Why are we interested in this? For many reasons, but one uh, recent reason is that there's been slow wage growth uh, since the last recession and even before that, and this has ignited government interest in addressing impediments to wage growth, which include a lack of competition uh, in the labor market among, men, among many other factors. So just to illustrate um, the growing interest in antitrust uh, from the DOJ and the FTC, uh, uh, as been, has been already mentioned, in 2010, the DOJ sued uh, Silicon Valley companies for no-poach agreements. Uh, also, to me, very interestingly, in 2016, uh, um, they issued an antitrust guidance for human resource professionals detailing the kinds of uh, behaviors by human resource professionals that are acceptable or unacceptable from an antitrust perspective. So I think that's very important to put it out there for everyone to see because it's not always intuitive uh, what is and isn't um, acceptable in this area. More recently, in 2018, FTC's chairman said in a congressional hearing, quote, we've told the staff that they're supposed to look at potential effects on the labor market with every merger that they review. And so on the issue of mergers and their impact on the labor market with respect to potential anti-competitive effects, I invite you to have a look at my paper with Herbert Hovenkamp, which has recently been uh, published. All right, so this is just to set the stage. Uh, now, let me introduce to you a key economic concept that is going to help you think about competition in the labor market, namely the uh, labor supply elasticity. So what is the labor supply elasticity and why does it matter to understand competition in the labor market? So think of it this way. If you think about this elasticity, another synonym uh, for it might be sensitivity. Uh, one way you can think about it is to think about a worker who's currently in a job and ask what would it take for this worker to quit? More specifically, how much of a wage decrease would a worker endure before they would quit their current job? So why is this relevant here? Well, if you think about it, if the elasticity is low, meaning that the worker isn't very sensitive to such a wage decrease, that creates an opportunity for employers to pay workers less because the workers will not quit or not easily quit for a given wage decrease. So if workers in this perspective, if workers have low sensitivity to wages, aka low elasticity, that means that uh, employers are able to pay them less and less below their actual contribution to production and still uh, have workers not quit or few workers are quitting. Oops, I think I just lost my uh, slides here. All right. I think I remember what I want to say next, which is, so that's one way of looking at the problem. And I want to tell you about another way of looking at the problem. By the way, this first way, looking at the quit elasticity, there's a whole literature in labor economics addressing that. Uh, another way of looking at it, so I told you a story about workers leaving their jobs. Now let's think about workers wanting to go to another job. So more like the hiring side uh, of this. So there we can think about the application elasticity. So when workers are looking for a job, how sensitive are they to wages? 
and in particular, how much can a firm who's trying to recruit underpay workers before nobody will come or very few workers will come. So that's uh, the side of the elasticity of application. So when we recruit workers, how much do workers care about wages? How sensitive are they to wages? So the basic conclusion from this concept is that the elasticity of labor supply is a good measure for competition and that lower elasticity means lower competition. From these two examples, you can see that if workers have low elasticity, that means that I can pay them less and not have them quit in drones. I can pay them less and still get workers apply to my vacancy. So that's the key idea here. So the lower the elasticity, the lower the state of competition in the labor market. Conversely, think about this. Think about a perfectly competitive labor market. That means that nobody can shortchange me as a worker because there's somebody else next door who will immediately take me up at the competitive wage level. So in that sense, the elasticity is infinite in an extreme case. Any small change in wages will make me quit and go to the next best option next door. And there's many, many of those by assumption of a very competitive labor market. So let's think about the determinants of this elasticity. What makes the elasticity lower, which implies lower competition in the labor market? So I, there are many factors that you can think of, and I invite you to think of examples from your own practice, but I want to highlight here two particular factors. One is job differentiation. So jobs are different from each other, and one very important dimension for workers, as my work has shown, is distance from their home. So workers tend to prefer jobs that are close to home, and that limits uh, the labor supply elasticity because uh, you know, there might be a, a relevant job that is quite far, so if the job that's closer to me underpays me, I might still take it because the faraway job isn't really equivalent from my perspective because it's too far from uh, where I live. So that's one aspect, job differentiation. Of course, it, the jobs could differ in many other dimensions. And the second aspect that I want to talk to you about and is highly relevant to enforcement is uh, job availability. And in particular, I want to make an important distinction between jobs that are nominally available, that I'm going to be able to capture through looking at the number of vacancies in a certain labor market. So these jobs, you might think, are available. But I want to attract your attention to the fact that even if those jobs are nominally there, there are vacancies open. That doesn't fully represent the state of competition in that labor market for a number of reasons. First of all, if you have a no poaching agreement, well, there might be a vacancy, but workers who are coming from competitors are going to be essentially not able to take up that vacancy because the two firms agree not to poach each other's employees. So the, the opportunity for a given worker to move, move to a competitor is going to be lower. So even though the vacancy is there, in fact, the chances that the worker will move to the job of the competitor is lower because of the no poach agreement. The no poach agreement is one thing, more uh, uh, severely curtailing is the non-compete, because the non-compete applies to all competitors, not just a competitor that we agreed with, but any competitor that satisfied the condition in the non-compete. So now I have all these jobs around me that potentially I could apply to, but in fact, my non-compete might say that within two years, I'm not allowed to work for any competitors within a five mile, 10 mile radius, even if there's jobs there, in reality, those jobs are not for me because of the non-compete. So again, this reduces job availability compared to what you might think uh, in the presence uh, of non-competes. And the third factor I want to talk to you about is labor market concentration. So that too decreases effective job, job availability. So for example, in a given labor market, you might have, who knows, a hundred Starbucks jobs. It looks like there's a lot of jobs, but if they are all controlled by the same entity, the degree of competition between those two jobs is very different because as I go to one job, maybe I got an offer from two of those jobs, but it's still Starbucks. So they're not going to go into a bidding war with themselves in order to uh, hire me. So that's another way in which uh, labor market concentration decreases job availability compared to the exact same situation with the same number of jobs, but where every employer would be just posting one vacancy. So 
The upshot of this is that lower labor supply elasticity means lower competition and that restraints and other features that I just talked to you about lower the labor supply elasticity is expected to lower it and to lower the competition in the labor market. So now I want to tell you about a new paper that I just uh, finished a draft of with uh, my co-author Jose Azar and Steve Barry. So in this paper, we use a state-of-the-art model from industrial organization, which is the branch of economics that you would find most commonly in antitrust litigation because it deals with issues of pricing uh, in the product market. But now I want to import those tools into the labor market. And specifically, what I'm going to do is to use application data. Uh, so looking at workers, what kinds of jobs they apply to. So this is a big data kind of uh, project. Here you go, I said the buzzword. So um, in the model, we have the worker first choosing which market they're going to apply to. So I define a market by an occupation at, at the SOC 6 level um, uh, of detail and a commuting zone. So such a market would be something like accountant and auditors in DC. Okay? So at that first level of decision, I decide as an accountant, am I going to apply to accountant and auditor job in DC or maybe in the, let's say, Philadelphia area where, I, where I'm from. So based on the wages in all those different markets, I'm going to choose which particular market to target. Okay, so that's the first stage. Then in the second stage, I chose which market is the most worthwhile for me. I decide which particular job opening to apply in that market. Let's say I chose Washington DC accountant and auditors. Now I'm going to choose a particular vacancy as a function of the wage and all the other job characteristics. So with this setup, we are able to derive one very important measurement, which is the market level elasticity of applications. So that means how much the market level wage uh, boost in that, how much would that increase job applications to the whole market? So again, if we think about accountants and auditors in DC, if I increase the average wage in all vacancies, how many more people are gonna come from other markets uh, and apply to my market? This elasticity is highly relevant because it speaks to the ability of a hypothetical monopsonist, an employer who would monopsonize this market, to lower wages. And so if the elasticity is low, that means that the hypothetical monopsonist could lower wages quite a bit uh, without fear that the workers would go elsewhere. Right? So this is uh, what we are going to measure here. And in the next slide, I'm going to show you results looking at different occupations estimating their market level elasticities and comparing those estimates with the critical elasticity from the hypothetical monopsonist test. And the logic there is that if the elasticity is low, and in this case below that critical elasticity, then the hypothetical monopsonist would be able to profitably decrease wages by 5%. Okay, so that's, that's the fundamental test here. So let's look at the results. I'm sorry, this might be a little bit hard to read in terms of the details. So you have there the most common occupations in the US. Um, and you, they are ranked uh, by their median uh, elasticity. So for each occupation, what you see there is a box plot. And I want to, because you know, in the interest of time, I want to direct your attention to the median, which is the little uh, you know, line in the middle of the box. So that's the median. It means that 50% have uh, elasticity higher than that, 50% below. And uh, this is estimated for each occupation. Now, why does an occupation have different elasticities? Because remember, I'm also considering the commuting zone. So some commuting zones, therefore some areas in the country might have lower or high elasticity. So that's the whole range of elasticities for each occupation. You see the maximum and the minimum are at the extremes. So what you see is that in every in every of the most common occupations, the median elasticity is below the critical elasticity, implying that this market definition is plausible uh, by the hypothetical monopsonist test for all of these most common occupations. And because there are common occupations, that would mean that there are relatively many jobs, because that's how I define common, by how many jobs are there in these occupations. Presumably, for less common occupation, it might be that the elasticity is even lower. So 
Furthermore, so okay, just if you look, you can see that, for example, the most elastic, so the areas, the kinds of occupation with more competition are things like sales representatives and telemarketers, and the least elastic uh, occupations are in trucking. Both light truck and heavy truck have very low elasticities, meaning that there is relatively little competition uh, in those uh, specific types of uh, occupations. Furthermore, we also look at, is there a difference between high and low skilled occupations? And we don't find a systematic difference. Depending on how you look at the data, sometimes the low skill or the high skill occupation have high elasticity. So the upshot is that from our data, there is no systematic uh, uh, difference in competition between low and high skill markets. Basically, it depends what market we're looking at. So it's important to look at the particular market. You can't assume that obviously low skill markets means the workers have so many opportunities and they can go anywhere. So the elasticity is really high. That's not the case. It might be the case in some markets, but generally speaking, there's no systematic uh, pattern right here. That's important because it goes against, again, a common intuition that as a low skill market worker, I can obviously just go to another job. This data shows that that's not the case, at least not systematically. We also show in this paper that rural areas have lower elasticities. So generally speaking, if we are comparing less densely populated areas with more densely populated areas, systematically less densely populated areas tend to have lower elasticity, meaning lower competition. So that is uh, something that could be of concern uh, for enforcement. So. I just established that an occupation by commuting zone is a plausible market definition. Now let's zoom in on labor market concentration, which is one of the reasons why competition might be lower. So here, uh, from a paper with uh, Jose Azar uh, and Marshall Steinbaum, who's here in Lady Tasca, we have uh, data on all US vacancies, and we look at the concentration of US labor markets by geography. We find that the majority, or 60% of labor markets, are highly concentrated. And furthermore, as you can see, concentration tends to be higher in less densely populated uh, areas. Secondly, we also look at the link between labor market concentration and wages, and we show that higher labor market concentration is associated with lower wages uh, in that market. This graph you're seeing here doesn't uh, control for anything, but in our analysis, we look at many potential confounding factors and we find that the relationship is solid uh, to many potential uh, other factors that we, we uh, uh, have accounted for. And furthermore, there's now a huge literature that I'm citing here confirming this negative relationship in the US between wages and labor market concentration. And this uses very different data sources and also different uh, market definitions, but the fact is there. I think at this point we can call it a stylized fact. Generally speaking, higher concentration is associated with lower wages in a labor market. So this uh, is the end of my uh, remarks, and I'd like to uh, give the floor to uh, Professor Prager. Great. Thanks, Ioana. Good morning, everyone. Um, I, before I get started, I want to thank the Department of Justice and especially Doha Meki for organizing today's workshop. I'm really delighted that the DOJ and FTC are both taking issues of labor market concentration quite seriously. So let me just pick up right where Joanna left off. Joanna has already laid out for us the evidence for a link between employer concentration and worker pay. And this last plot that she has put up um, is really a great example of what a wide variety of papers in the academic literature have recently established, which is that labor markets with high employer concentration tend to have low wages. The evidence on this point, as Joanna said, is pretty compelling, but it doesn't necessarily have to imply that limited competition in labor markets is itself the cause of lower wages. This is an important point because if labor market uh, concentration and low wages tend to go together for some other reason that isn't necessarily causal, then the agency's attempts to shore up labor competition may not result in the desired salutary effects on labor itself. So let me give you one very simplified example 
um, from actually Joanna's map. And I think I had another label on this. There we go. Okay. Um, so this green low concentration market that's on the left of the map where you're looking is the San Francisco commuting zone. Now, San Francisco, as you know, is a dense urban area. It's got many employers, which means that labor concentration um, is going to be quite low. No single employer or small group of employers can by themselves dominate the labor market. Wages in San Francisco are also quite high by national standards, especially if we compare them to a place like Northern Maine. So that's my other little red highlighted market at the top right of the map. This part of Maine is quite rural with relatively few employers and therefore a very highly concentrated labor market by the definition that's been used in the literature. Wages here are a lot lower than they are in San Francisco, about 30% for hospital employed nursing administrators and pharmacists. But the cost of living is also substantially lower. In fact, it's about 40% lower than it is in San Francisco. So it's actually not clear that the workers in Northern Maine are the ones getting the raw deal. Now, economists do control for these kinds of patterns. And in fact, Joanna's work and some of the other papers that she has mentioned also control for these kinds of issues. But I think this is still a good illustrative example because it highlights some of the issues that might come up. So in particular, if you've got things that co-move with employer concentration and wages that are a little bit more complicated than cost of living, and especially if they're changing within a single labor market over time, then that can contaminate the results. So what should be clear, hopefully, from this example is that high concentration going hand in hand with low wages is not necessarily a sign that lack of labor market competition is really to blame. And since the rest of today's workshop will be spent talking about anti-competitive behavior and possible antitrust remedies, I, I want to spend the remainder of my remarks on why we should not dismiss these issues out of hand. Why, despite the fact that there are other mechanisms that might explain at least some of the patterns that Joanna has mentioned, there's reason to think that some of these findings are indeed explained by high concentration causing low wages. So before I do that, let me first walk through um, another way of thinking about the conceptual explanations for how employer market power can result in low wages. So when employers are concentrated and possess market power, that market power can result in lower wages in a couple of different ways. The first one that you'll often hear economists talk about is one that I refer to as classical monopsony. Classical monopsony is the theoretical construct that directly mirrors the type of market power that a monopolist seller has when it is the only seller of a good. So this is something Yohan already mentioned, but let me give you sort of the, the more typical definition, which is that a classical monopsonist is an employer that is the only game in town, meaning workers can either work for that employer or be out of a job entirely. Now, for every worker, as Joanna has already explained, there's a certain wage that the employer has to pay in order to keep that worker there rather than preferring to be unemployed. So, for instance, that could be a wage that's just enough to cover the cost of the commute and childcare as a bare minimum. Normally, employers have to compete for a worker, and one way they do that is by bidding up wages. But a monopsonist employer can just decide, you know what, I'm going to pay workers less than what the going wage would be if the labor market were perfectly competitive. And I'm going to accept that that means I'm going to get fewer employers, or sorry, employees. Some workers will not be willing to work at that wage. I'm going to have fewer employees producing my good and generating revenue. But on the other hand, I'll be able to pay them less. And so I might actually end up more profitable in the long run. And that's exactly this hypothetical monopsonist test that was discussed. So, Classical monopsony, where the employer really has a great deal of labor market power, is one possible mechanism for concentration to drive down wages. But this classical monopsony picture that I've just described is really more of a useful abstraction than a description of how actual labor markets work in practice. Very few employers have a truly captive audience of potential workers, right? If conditions get bad enough, some workers might pick up and move to a new city. Others might invest in retraining for a different career in a different industry. So the other issue here is that the classical monopsony mechanism really only works for reducing wages. If every worker in the company that's doing the same job 
is paid the same wage. Otherwise, it's not really a classical monopsonist. So in practice, what that ends up meaning is that a much larger concern about employer concentration is what it does to workers' so-called bargaining leverage. When an employer grows bigger, whether that's organically or via merger and acquisition activity, that means workers in that industry now have fewer employers competing to hire them. Fewer employers trying to win them over by offering pay raises or improvements in working conditions, uh, and frankly, just fewer new job openings or vacancies in Ioana's terminology outside of their current employer where they already work. This means that a juggernaut employer can put downward pressure on wages, and that can push down wages that are the going market wage and affect workers who are working throughout that labor market, not just at the large employer itself. So basically, when an employer uh, concentrates or consolidates, that's going to lead to worse outside options for workers, and that will eventually affect equilibrium wages in that labor market. And unlike classical monopsony, this bargaining leverage is something that can work even when workers doing the same job aren't necessarily all paid the same. So it's much more applicable to real-world labor markets than a classical monopsony mechanism might appear to be. But whether it's classical monopsony or bargaining leverage, the end result is the same. It's that higher employer concentration is going to put downward pressure on wages, and that can indeed be a causal mechanism. Now, thinking about employer concentration leading to employers having market power over workers requires a little bit of mental gymnastics if you're coming from a standard antitrust background. In most antitrust applications, the entity that has the market power is the producer or seller of a good or service, and the entities that can be harmed are the purchasers of that good. When we're talking about labor market power, we have to turn this intuition on its head. In other words, the entity that has the market power is now the purchaser of workers' labor. And the entities that can suffer harm are the workers that sell their services to the employer. But the good news is that the intuition that you already possess from applications where the seller has monopoly power translates pretty easily into applications where the buyer has monopsony power. You just have to invert a few things. So we've inverted who has the market power. It's now the buyer of the labor and sell, instead of the seller of the good. And we've got to invert what the effect is. The powerful buyer wants lower prices of labor instead of a powerful seller wanting higher prices of the good that it is selling. And so the effect is to drive wages down instead of driving product prices up. With that inverted intuition in place, we can also think about extending many of the familiar tests uh, from antitrust and many of the familiar tools to the labor market power context. The hypothetical monopsonist, or sorry, the hypothetical monopolist test, which we would normally use to ask whether a monopolist seller could, in principle, increase prices by a small but significant and non-transitory amount, becomes the hypothetical monopsonist test, which then asks whether a monopsonist employer could in principle decrease wages by a small but significant and non-transitory amount. Similarly, the upward pricing pressure index, or UPP, which normally measures the relative price markup that a merger can generate, can become the downward wage pressure index to measure the relative mark down in wages that an employer merger might generate. The bottom line is that although we're used to thinking of market power in the hands of sellers, the tools that antitrust practitioners have developed can also equally be used to analyze market power in the hands of employers. So let's say we have the tools to analyze employer market power. The question is, does that mean the DOJ or FTC could actually act to enforce competition in labor markets when competition is threatened? Well, we've gotten some examples of that in the introductory remarks already. And here again, I'd like to draw some parallels to what we're used to thinking about from enforcement in product markets. So for example, existing high levels of concentration and market power are not actionable in and of themselves. So even if there were only a handful of key employers in northern Maine, the agencies can't just break up those employers without good reason. And a good reason might be something like anti-competitive conduct by those employers. So if they have no poaching agreements in place in which they agree not to hire each, other worker, each other's workers away by offering them a raise, that's essentially analogous to price fixing by sellers. Or if those employers have punitive, unnecessarily punitive non-compete clauses that 
prevent their workers from being able to leave and work at a different job. That's somewhat analogous to a predatory contract termination fee. So these are the types of cases that might be actionable and they'll be discussed in a lot more detail in the second panel, so I won't get into the weeds now. But what I do want to draw your attention to is a second potential area for enforcement, which is mergers of employers. The horizontal merger guidelines, of course, outline thresholds such that if a proposed merger of two sellers increases product market concentration by more than that threshold amount, then the merger is automatically subject to some scrutiny. Analogously, if a merger of two employers increases market, labor market concentration, that then there's an argument to be made that that should or could also be subject to similar types of scrutiny from the agencies. And crucially here, economic theory is informative about when we might expect an employer merger to generate such downward wage pressure. If workers can't easily move to a different job, whether that's because they're geographically tied to their area, because they prefer things that are close to home, or because it would take years of training to switch to a different occupation uh, with a similar level of pay, or because they, the work they do is highly specific to that employer, like operating high-tech custom-built machinery, then the merger will generate more downward wage pressure for those workers. So as an example, and to my knowledge, this is purely hypothetical, suppose Amazon and Microsoft were to merge. Purely hypothetical. They are currently the two tech giants in the Seattle area, of course, uh, and economic theory tells us to expect that tech workers who can easily pick up and move to Silicon Valley after Amazon and Microsoft merge are going to be much less affected than Seattle area tech workers who are tied to Seattle and are then probably going to have to accept lower wages or at least slower wage growth from the new supergiant Amazsoft or however you want to abbreviate the two. Now, since mergers aren't really a focus of any of today's panels but are presumably of interest for this audience, I want to spend the rest of my remarks elaborating them on them a little bit. I discussed earlier why the fact that wages tend to be lower in places that have high employer concentration doesn't necessarily mean that the lower wages are about the concentration itself, although the evidence does seem to point in that direction. Um, it could be you know, correlation rather than causation. So for determining whether labor market concentration can actually cause low wages, we can use some of the tools that Ioana described earlier, but there are also other types of evidence that we might turn to in order to bolster the case. It's useful, for example, to look at uh, a different type of evidence where concentration is changing in a local labor market, and we can look at what happens to wages as that concentration changes. Mergers are a very natural way to do this. And that's what I did in a recent academic study with my co-author, Matt Schmidt. In the study, we examine what happens to hospital workers' pay growth after a hospital merger. We looked at 10 years of consummated hospital mergers in the US from 2000 through 2010, and we categorized hospital labor markets as falling into one of five bins, depending on their merger activity. Over a given time period, a labor market might experience no within market hospital mergers, in which case it's assigned to our empirical control group, or a labor market might experience hospital mergers that affect the labor market concentration to differing degrees. We measure how much concentration is affected by a merger using the change in the employment Herfindahl index induced by the merger. So this is actually the same measure that shows up on Joanna's maps. And if employer HHI or Herfindahl goes up by a lot due to the merger, then the labor market becomes less green and more red on one of her lovely maps. We bend our mergers into four categories, from the smallest to the largest increases in HHI. So now let me walk you through sort of the economic hypotheses that theory might suggest to us. If employer concentration actually causes downward wage pressure, then what we would expect to see is that wages grow slower after the mergers that generate the largest increases in local labor market HHI. If wages in those markets grow at the same rate as in other markets that either have smaller mergers or no merger activity, then that might imply that increasing employer concentration isn't actually what's slowing down the wage growth. Similarly, if employer concentration is in fact the culprit, then we would expect to see workers that are more specialized to the hospital industry being more affected by wage slowdowns following a hospital merger. 
And in the study, the way that we look at this is by binning workers into three categories. We've got some blue collar workers, like custodial staff and cafeteria workers who are generally not very specialized to the healthcare context. We've got some higher skilled, but still somewhat specialized and somewhat generalist workers. Uh, these are mostly white collar staff, folks like social workers and insurance claims professionals. And then our third and most highly specialized category of workers are nursing administration people and pharmacists who are the most healthcare specific workers that we can observe in the data. So if employer consolidation actually causes downward wage pressure, the group we would expect to see affected the most by hospital mergers are the nurses and pharmacists, and we would expect to see those effects most for the largest mergers that move local employer HHI the most. And in fact, that is exactly what we see. So for our least specialized blue collar category, which are the four bars on the left of the plot, we see no effects of hospital mergers on subsequent wage growth, no matter the size of the concentration increase induced by the merger. For the two more specialized worker groups, so our sort of white collar non-medical staff in the middle, and then the nursing and pharmacy category uh, being the right hand set of bars, we actually do see wages growing slower following the largest HHI increasing mergers, although not so much when you look at the smaller mergers that only move HHI by a little bit. Now, in the paper, we've got a bunch of additional analyses that suggest these estimates are genuinely picking up an effect of employer labor market power on wages rather than other mechanisms. But the bottom line that I want you to take away from this is that we have corroborating evidence that at least some of the patterns that Ioana has documented uh, in terms of the correlation between high concentration and low wages really can be attributed to a story of probable causation rather than just correlation. So what that means is that an antitrust environment that supports competitive labor markets might actually be effective at combating downward wage pressure. And that means that the discussions that'll take place for the rest of today are both meaningful and important. So I encourage everyone to stick around for the rest of the day. Thanks.